Denny, how are you, brother? I'm very good, brother. How are you? Yeah. Uh, good to very... finally uh, speak to you, man. And get a chin yeah. wag. Yeah, it's um, in for people listening or watching in the Marines, you meet these, or you 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 you're passing ships with these legendary characters all the time, of which Denny is one, and uh, especially with the joys of Facebook you get to sort of get glimpses of people's life, but you've never actually yeah, met them, but they're your brother because you've been in this, this military band of brothers. And um, it's not just great to finally meet, but it's, it's just so nice to feel like you already know somebody. To, to, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I feel the same. I've been watching you for years and we've been chatting and, and, and being able to sort of, communicate as those years have gone by but uh we haven't yet had a chance to have a, a proper chin wag so this is this is great I, I saw you with Buster Keaton the other day and I was like it was great to see Buster after so many years having a chat with you so that was great did you serve with Buster yeah I did in 40 commando mate yeah I was in that Northern Ireland trip with him too uh, okay yeah he's a one Norway I think maybe as well yeah he's a wonderful man um very very he's so kind and and uh like we just had when I when we did our length or well, when I did my length of Britain run, we just we just had it was one of it was, with him and Steve Salmon, another Marine. It was just one of the best best days I best days I had. No, well, Chris, I'm living out here in Thailand, and I was watching it from here, just watching what was going on, and and seeing Buster come out and 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 offer help in pure Buster style. You know that's who he is as a guy. You know. And then to see how he, he didn't just drop you off. He went on and did, was it 40 miles with you? Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It was all unplanned as well. He just um, he just said, give me the backpack. And I'm like, no, 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 no. He's like, just give me the backpack. All right, there you go. As most put next word, right? As yeah. it, it would be. I said, it's fucking heavy, mate. No, oh, okay, I'll be all right. And I'll tell you what, you know, it, 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 this didn't come easy. He would, you know, I could see the, I'm just going to adjust my camera a wee bit. I could see the, um, I could see the strain on his face, but, you know, it's that, that determination, isn't it, that we've, that for, for, what, what, why do you, have you ever heard of the term uh, Da Vinci personality? I haven't heard of the term Da Vinci personality, no. Well, I'm, I'm in contact with a fascinating guy who I'm proud to call my friend, um, Graham. And Graham, or Graham Bint is his full name. Graham is, he he's massively knows a lot about PTSD and this kind of stuff. He's a former paratrooper um, with with the RAF, which was something I was unaware, unaware of when, when we met. And he just sent me some information, and one of the the the, the inf part of the information he sent me was this personality trait called the Da Vinci personality. And when you read this stuff, it really some kind of sums up a lot about myself. And I try and give you some examples. So it's people that are sort of quite manic, you know, they're into lots of things and they're excited and they want to get the bulk of a project done, but they might not like see the end of it because that doesn't interest them as much. They tend to be, I'm, I'm, I'm probably sort of guessing a lot here, but I think they tend to be misunderstood by their peers. Um, it's, it's a lot of, I, I, probably should have prepared myself better but I, I just think it's there's a definite personality trait in the marines of, 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 of I wouldn't say all marines are this kind of personality but certainly there's a lot of interesting characters aren't there well there is a, a lot of interesting characters and as you were um describing the da vinci personality right that's what you call it da vinci i'm yeah. thinking okay i'm i'm definitely a, one of those uh, for sure <laughs> But, that, but then thinking about that also, right, like, let's think about the Marines. And I think this is where a lot of our friends go wrong when they get sad and suicidal and things like that is 
when you're playing the role of a Marine, whether it be a Marine or a Lance Corporal or a Corporal or a Lieutenant or a, or a Captain and all the way up the, the chain, you're only given a little bit of the, the, the plot. Your job is this, you hand it over to them. His job is that, he hands it on to them. Do you mean so we have a chain, a chain of command which we are used to running little bits of an operation, then we go do our own thing, little bits of an operation, we do a thing. So that personality, as we were talking, makes me think like that you know like we as 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 disciplined men, disciplined men working together in unison we're only ever trained to do one little bit of something not the start not the finish you know what i mean yeah you can, making sense there yeah very um, much because we get lost in civilian life i think most of us i was just looking into the timeline of of where we are now i joined in 1989 i did around eight years seven and a bit years and then I've been out 24 years, you know. So when you look at, I've been out longer, way longer than I was a, a, a Marine, but yet still my daily life, I'm, but thanks to Facebook for sure, and, and, and being able to talk to you guys over the years, it's brought back a bit of that um, bootneck spirit, which was personal to me before social media began, you know. So while I was traveling the world the first time in 1997, looking for my soul and my spirit, I didn't have Facebook didn't have any communication with Bootneck. So the commando spirit that was in me was something I was trying constantly to live with. But it was, it's tough when you've not got that same team working on that same mission or that same I, goal. I think I tried to forget it. I mean, I didn't purposely try to forget it. It just, the Marines literally wasn't a part of my life for, I'm going to put an arbitrary figure here now, but say 20 years, right? Yeah, yeah. A part of that was that, you know, I I don't want to say I left under a bad light. That, that That's not the right term. But I got so fucked off of it in the end. When I was, yeah, me too. To, you know, I was trying to leave to run a business and, and, and better my life. Yeah. And when certain in, it wasn't this wasn't everybody, but certain individuals yeah. just were like, "What the fuck you doing? Fuck <laughs> that man! Stay in the Marines, you know." The fucking and and that I mean that that in itself wasn't the biggest problem. It was that people would like purposely put you on duty, knowing that this weekend I had a big business presentation to go and give or something like that. Yeah, you know, in your way. Yeah, yeah, and. And I just started to sort of see the Marines. It, it's just a job like every other. There's good people. There's bad. It's, it, you know, we can't just harp on about the fact we got a green berry like seven years ago. And that still makes us like a special person. You know, it, 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 times change. People change. You've got to move on, right? So but don't you think that? Everyone who left the core, left the core kind of under the same dress, right? We all left the core because most of us left the core, except if you retire and you go out with gracefully and all these things. Most of us left the core saying, fuck you, that's it, I want nothing to do with you fuckers, I'm fucking sick of it, in, in a sense. But the institution continues on, man, and it doesn't matter how we aggressively dis disagree with the, the way it went on. We're no one, you know, we're just, we're just little souls who just mm. have to move on and let that continue on because the role of the Royal Marines is a lot more um, important than the role of us finding ourselves or, you know, that's when we started re reassessing things and, and looking for a life outside the core. And that was naturally the time for us to leave. Otherwise, we'd still be in the core, mate, still banging it out and, yeah. and, and speaking in a funny, in a funny song. <laughs> well, fate, fate, like you said, Facebook came along for me and... Changed everything. I started to realise... Like I knew a lot of nice people in the Marines, you know, and they were starting to come and friend me on Facebook and the odd one would pop up and I would friend them. And that, and uh, so I said, the guys, you know, a lot of you are where I live. Let's get together for a beer. Come on, let, you know, let's stop. I, I felt, I feel like Facebook is being a bit childish. Hmm. You know, it, it, it's like we're real men. And women, but in the Marines, obviously men. Let let's just yeah. meet. Let's meet up like adults and stop like liking and you know tickling and giving thumbs up and all this <laughs> stuff. And it was re it was actually an interesting experiment because what happened is I started a Facebook group 
And because I left the tick box like open, like anybody can invite anybody, I woke yeah. up in the morning and there was 2,000 people on there. <laughs> oh, wow. Right. So wow. my, you know, 15 guys in a pub catching up had now gone to 2,000 people and I had to start. That's amazing, mate. Well done. Yeah. Well, I had to, you know, organize a proper reunion, right? Yeah. And the point I'm getting to is through this process, a lot of the pride came back to me of, of what we achieved back then. And you only get one life and it's okay to be proud of your achievements. You know, that's okay. It doesn't mean that you're a warmonger or that you believe in this, you know, the, the project for the new American century and all of this sort of stuff. Which is all very interesting and, and, re and revelations of this sort of stuff came way after my military career. You know, when you look at why wars are caused and, and you can go back in history all the way through the, the world wars into way before that, you can see that these wars were politically, economically, or monarch, you know, a monarch wanted some land. That's just the way it went. I didn't join the Corps for that at all. I was 16 years old. 15 when I started the process and I was done with with what I was living I was done with my family I was, I was done with my friends even though I loved them dearly I didn't want to do that I wanted to do something different I was a young Catholic and I and I, and I sort of just outside Glasgow area so the areas were divided into Catholics and Protestants we went to Catholic schools and all these different things so there was it was the 70s man when I was born so it was the IRA was 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 a big thing so by the time I get to 1988 when I'm applying for the Royal Marines you know, most of my family stopped talking to me when I was accepted. So I wasn't winning me going into the Marines. It wasn't, it wasn't because I was winning something. I went there because I wanted to get away from these fucking people who were crazy. So which part of Thailand are you in, Danny? I'm in a little, island, a little island called Koh Tao. Koh Tao, um, okay. I've been on Koh Tao. Yeah, we've been here eight years now, man. Yeah, I've, I've literally just right there, there's a video of me diving on Kota, the days when we had to take vi make videos. Um, yeah. The reason I'm asking is, do you meet many IRA men? In, in, in I've met a few over the years, yeah, for sure. Uh -huh, I, yeah. I, I ask you that because when I worked on the doors in Hong Kong, I, I would yeah. meet them. And, and, you know, sometimes it went really well, as in, you know, connection is, is if you can't connect with people, the world's fucked, right? Yeah. And other times it was like, Fuck off, you British cunt! Basically, you know. Um, I'm just both, happened. both fair enough, you know. Like at the time, both fair enough, you know. Depending where how angry that person is at that time, and and, and what your what your role will be when you meet them, you know. Like at the end of the day, I've got to admire the warriors who fucking did what they did. It's disgusting what they did, but it was still the human inside them still had to do it and then deal with the conflict afterwards. Just like us soldiers are finding out now, you know. So that was their war. It's a different gig. Yeah, Same as the I, I, now, you know, you know, my, my, my sort of bottom line is you, if you don't respect your enemy, then that, that, how can that be good? You know, yeah. you don't yeah, have I, to I only, have, have looking at your enemy, which looks like your brother is, is daunting. Mm. And, and, uh, have you ever had, had the chance to sit down with these guys and talk about the troubles yeah. or? Yeah, absolutely. Most recently, even just the last year, um, I came across a guy that we sat down for a long time. He thought I had some sort of, I was saying snidey remarks behind him. So even though we'd become friends, he was still mistrusting. And uh, we took, a, we took a, an hour away one day to discuss all this before it got out of hand. And, uh, and he was just misinterpreting things I said. He didn't realize that I have no political or, or any hatred towards any of the Irish people or even the Iraqis, if there's Muslims anywhere that's fought against us. That's not who I am. That was something you and your government were fighting against, not something me. I was a, a soldier at the time. I wasn't a leader. I was a soldier. And my job was to support my mates and make sure they were safe and get them home. End of. That was it. No, no political, no religious views on it. It was a massive eye-opener going to Belfast, West Belfast, and seeing Catholics and Protestants running around sniffing glue, the, the state that people were in, you know, it was, it was sad. You know, I, I, I had a, I had never been to Ireland so, or North Ireland, so I had a sort of maybe a romantic view as a kid listening to my family singing songs and saying Free Ireland and talking about the good times. But when I got to Belfast, it was, it was far from that. And I wasn't, I was disgusted with both Catholics and Protestants, the way they were conducting their lifestyles. 
in general, not necessarily everyone, because that's not how you do society, but certainly the people who are attacking us verbally with dog shit and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's pretty disgusting stuff, man. And it's a shame that your society would get to that point when, you know, the guys who are sent there to stop you guys fighting with the guys who end up becoming the victims of um, hatred. I, I don't think people quite can un understand unless you've been there the level of of hatred just the like, no, level of hatred i've never seen it anywhere else in my life that was bad from from four-year-old children that are too young to know anything about you know life other than how to put a bloody spoon in their mouth a it's an adventure for them. this 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 vitriol is that the right word you know utter <laughs> hatred I think, it, thankfully, it's changed a lot. You know, it's, that was back when we, we were, it was 92, we were there? 92, I think, 92, 93, something like that. 91, 92. Can't remember. 92, 92. But uh, it's changed a lot, man. That was 17 years ago, right? So, yeah. is that 17 years, 17 years ago? So, you, you, more than that, even, I think you've, you've got it 27 years ago. Danny, the reason I mention it is that, you know, because of my YouTube channel, I get approached by a lot of people and it... It's, I think some people misinterpret when I say I love everybody and I'm not going to make judgment on the Northern Ireland. I'm just, it's not my fucking job to make judgment on it. What, how could I, you know, I can exactly. tell you what I think of it and my experience. Yeah, but you're, you're a very open-minded person, Chris, and that's why I, I love you and that's why I'm drawn to look at you and watch you more because you have that openness. You've taken your time out to study yourself in self-development, in an enlightenment sense. So you, you can understand what it is you're saying, and I can understand what it is you're saying, and I could stand by your side and we could argue that case. But when you've stopped thinking about something and you've left it with hatred, then every time you think about it again, you're going to begin with hatred. And I think the art of forgiving someone and being forgiven is something that's not really understood, even though like it's Christianity and it's in its truest sense, maybe as well as Islam, it's but their truest sense is to be to be able to forgive and to be forgiven as the basis of the, the fundamentals of the religion. It's the hardest thing for people to understand. But like you, I've had people who have done things to me and my choice is I avoid them. I, I don't go and reopen that conflict. I don't go and try and apologize and make it better unless I really liked them when I was drunk the night before I did something wrong and went too far. But if someone's gradually disliked me because of my moral values or because of who I am or who my, my family are or anything like that, it's a lot easier just to give them peace. Don't, don't aggravate them. Don't, make, don't let you be the source of their aggravation. And uh, sometimes it's lonely, but it creates peaceful life. And then as years pass by, when you see them next time, they've lost their anger. Yeah. You can just sit, you've, you've remained with your self-control. And a new relationship maybe can start from there, you know? It's, it's so, this isn't about like accepting that people have done disgustingly horrible things and saying, oh, that's, that's, it's not about that. It's about setting your soul free and letting go of that Absolutely. anger and understanding a situation from every, you know, from a holistic perspective. Why do people behave like they do? What's going on in their lives, in their minds? And, and once you can stop taking a side and step back and just view it like you would a TV program and, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, with, with less emotional attachment. Yeah, exactly. And, and what you're doing there is you're, for a start, you're lowering your own stress and your own involvement in something. And, and that- well, once again, once again, Chris, you and I, we, we've been educated in this and practiced in this so we can, we can talk about this. But the hardest thing, and I'm going to recall one of my hardest things, you know, the hardest thing when this rage is in you, it's very, very difficult. It's like stopping smoking. It's sometimes very difficult. I've done it many, many times throughout my life. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it's just like, oh, no, I'm not doing that again. And that's it. I don't do it again. You know, depending where your head's at is, is, is the way I think you have to approach everything, isn't it? You know, it doesn't matter how much we know about some subjects that other people have to jump onto that um, run of education. But when you're so angry, guys like me and you piss them off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, when I'm in the gym yeah, and I see someone I, going through a hard time, 
I'm like, come on, man, you got your head out of this. They're just like, fuck off, leave me alone, man. What are you talking about? What are you fucking righteous? I get called a preacher the other day. I'm a boxing coach, man, that's what we do. You know, I'm telling you how to get out of your funk. And if you don't want to accept that, leave the gym, you know? And, uh, and that, that's, that's pretty much how I operate. But let me go back to me, my anger, my most anger. I've just come back from five years in Iraq. It's 2003, my ex-wife's left. Turmoil, as you can imagine, right? It's tri- a stereotypical. So, uh, just for our listeners, did you say Iraq? I was in Iraq for five years, as 2003 con- and 2008 as a contractor. Yeah. As a security contract, so carrying a what a Kalashnikov, protecting multi weapons, multi weapons. Yeah, my, my first role was in Al Hilla in 2003. I got there in July 2003. I was the second in command to here's the it's a tongue twister, the coalition professional authorities HQ in south central region of Iraq called Al Hilla, which is spot on. It's the city where the ancient city of Babylon is. So that was my first first job in Iraq. And I was there for eight months and then I moved up to Baghdad. I was a second in command of the Iraqi government complex, you know, and in charge of the security establishment of the government, but through all the national elections and the prime minister, the president always is a high profile job. I was there for a month or so, and then I took over the command of that. So I did that for a few years. And then <clears throat> I left that job, went back out to Iraq six months later, and spent the next year working for another company, running, um, looking after sort of VIPs, but also running a bodyguard um, training school in Baghdad. Wow. So by the time I left that, I've come home, and, and, and as many of these guys, listeners will know, my wife had rifled all the money, gone away, left me in, in a situation within you know, days of me being back within a situation where I had no money. I'd just been five years in Iraq. And even when I wake up in the morning, I'd be happy to wake up in the morning. I remember it. I was happy it was not in Iraq. But then I would put my feet in the ground and this rage of what just had happened and the deceit that happened over all the years and all these different things, which is personal, but all these different things that were going on in my life just created this rage inside me. And um, it took training three times a day and eating well and losing, I think, 20 stone. Uh, 20 kilograms in five weeks, you know, I just went straight into training and, and isolated myself, didn't go meet anyone, didn't go drinking, just trained and, and became fit, wrote my first book, Fighting Your Demons, and really focused on not allowing this, what was going on around me, to break what I had created as a, I thought, an admirable character, a great leader, a, a crisis management consultant who would be engaged in conversations in crisis with generals and prime ministers, of Iraq and stuff like that. So getting home, my main mission was not to be angry, but I could feel the anger and it took me, hey man, it's, uh, that's 12 years later. It's taken me 12 years to say, hey, I think that anger's gone. Mm. But I didn't make that anger visible to the people who I love. Not all the time, at least. I'm sure there was a couple of drunken moments where I, I vented, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but, uh, it's... That's life. Yes. So let's let's go back because I'm I'm fully aware this is your story, Danny, and I I'm just um, I feel honoured to, to to hear it, and I, I also know it's it's going to enrich my life, and it's kind of going to validate. Uh, it's just going to validate like who I am, you know, and what I've learned over the years. So what can you? Uh, I mean, what kind of childhood? You you said you ca- grew up a Catholic in Glasgow. So, for our American friends, Glasgow is well. It's a city of many facets, but one of which is it's quite well known for having impoverished areas, uh, at, especially at, in the um, 70s and 80s, for sure. Yeah, is is that where? Did you grow up in one of those areas, or or? Um, I grew up in, um, out just outside Glasgow, I suppose it's southeast a little bit from Glasgow, um, about 15 miles, something like that, in a place called Newark's Hill, for those people who are listening in from that area, so they didn't get a mention, because it's a very small little place, um, which is next to Motherwell. Um, and the main, the main sort of um, employment was the steelworks and the mines, so everyone was a miner or a steelworker, um, the, the world I grew into. And uh, so during, during my, my youth, the steelworks closed through Maggie Thatcher, I think, and then the mines closed and things like that. So, yes, that's when I really understood people living in poverty. And, and uh, I suppose that was mid-80s to, to when I left in 89 going, I've had enough. I don't, I don't, 
I know now, looking back in hindsight, at 47 years old, I'm 48 now, right? I joined the Marines at 16. I've only lived two years back in Scotland since then. I'm not, I, I don't feel, I've never felt the urge to go live in Scotland again. Um, perhaps because of that, that experience, but I mean, Scotland's beautiful, but living in the schemes, I didn't want my son to be, um, my, my, my kids here to get brought up in a, a place like that, for sure not. Do you mean like projects, like? like? Yeah, it's a, I suppose it's like, um, it's a projects, you know, they, yeah. they call them the schemes, you know, the, the little electrical houses or government houses put up to, yeah, yeah. to, to, house, to house the workers, you know, I suppose in the mines and the, and the, yeah. and the surrounding steelworks. So what do you, have you been able to ascertain a driver behind why you joined up? I mean, mine was quite simple. I was, I was bet I couldn't be a Royal Marine. And yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's something like that. I suppose you know. my, my brother who's two and a half years older than me. We'd never really had a relationship. Even as a young kid, we'd, we've not spoken in a, you know, a lot, of, a lot of years, you know, he, uh, he attempted to join the Royal Marines, so he brought in all these. I was a young boxer. I started boxing at 11. He wasn't really into fitness, so it shocked me that he had all these booklets of how to do pull-ups and how to do push-ups and runs and sprints and all these different things. So I sort of stole his, uh, his workout programs and took it to mine and, and my mates. So we started training two years out doing marine circuits and all that sort of stuff. So when I was about 15, my mate wanted to go into the careers office to see he's a year older to see if he would join, if he could join. And I went in with him and uh, it was fun. It was a fun experience as a young kid, you know, getting the shit ripped out of you because we've got earrings in, wearing dungarees and flowery shirts. You know, it was like, it was, it was funny, man. It was one of, one of those funny moments that I really, I went into the army place with them, went into the RAF place with them, and then we went into the Marines and Navy place with them. And I just, I just thought it was hilarious. And, and yeah, I want to be hanging out with these guys. That was brilliant. So I walked away from that moment going, all right, I'm, I'm going to be a robbery. And then I approached my mum and dad to sign papers off for me, um, which wow. they were reluctant to do. And I was like, man, I want to do this. And then I think PRC was in November 5th. I remember November 5th, going down on a bus from Glasgow to, uh, to Limston and seeing all the fireworks going off. So I, I always remember it was, it was the 5th of November. That was the day I went to PRC. And then the following February is when I joined up at 16 in a few months, I suppose. 16. Yeah. Yeah, man. Were you 15 when you did your PRC? I think I just turned, I turned 15 at the end of June. So what was that? June, July, August, September. Um, maybe five months, 16, five months. Uh, and then three months later, I joined 16, eight months. Yeah, that was my only mission. I didn't want to do anything else. I was, but the thing is, you know, that I had a driving force. That was your point, right? What's your driving force? Mm -hmm. It wasn't to fuck my brother off. I think my brother thinks that, you know, but yeah, I was, I was such a good career in the Marines. It was because I was boxing. I'd already had 10 fights. Um, I won my first two. Had a great, a great coach, really inspired. I was, I was going to be world champion. I was certain of it. And then I lost eight fights in a row. Um, I was a young, youngster before the age of 16. So by the time the Royal Marines came up, it was like, get me the fuck out of here. I, I was embarrassed. You know, that I'd been to boxing all these years. But I have eight defeats in a row under my belt. And uh, I was quite happy to say goodbye to everyone. I think maybe deep down I was just... Did how was your like your home life? Was it did you ha was it stable? Was it happy families or or? No, um, you know, no one likes to speak too but harshly about their parents. And, and so before I say this, you know, I've made peace with them because you know it was a hard area. It was a tough area. Yeah, yeah. My dad was an electrician. My mother and an alcoholic. My mother was um, is still a, like a manic, clinically depressed person. Never really got a chance to have a quality of life outside that way of thinking. So, you know. Looking back in hindsight, I can understand their suffering. Um, how they brought their kids up, up isn't how I brought mine up. They believed in corporal punishment and beatings. I don't and haven't ever touched one of my kids at one time, you know, not even like a slap around the bum, you know, none of that nonsense. It was all about sitting them down, making them realize what it was and what they are doing and, and, and devising some punishment away from their um, easy life that they have, you know. But, you know, so, yeah, it was violent. It was violent. My dad was drunk a lot. Mum was depressed a lot. I didn't do very well at school. And uh, my brother ran away twice when we were kids. Gives you an idea of, of the sort of yeah. nonsense that was going I'm on. Try, I'm just trying, because I'm, I'm very I'm passionate about young people. That's why I, I paid £12,000 of my 
my inheritance I got when my mum was poisoned. <laughs> she got she died of asbestos poisoning, you know. Oh my goodness, yeah. And uh, no, this isn't a you know, it's no, no, it's, your mum and unfortunately so many many others. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so twelve thousand pounds of the money. She didn't leave a lot of money, but twelve thousand pounds of that money went to pay off my student loan. You know, which is another yeah. massive government scam. It's not even a government scam. It's just a corporate corporate scam. I'll talk more about that. Scams all over the place, man. Yeah, talk more about that another day outside of Denny's yeah. precious time. But but yeah, I'm pa- passionate about young people, so I thought I studied youth work and get a lot of young people watching my YouTube channel. And I want, you know, I, I'm just doing for these guys what was never done for me, Danny, which is telling them the truth, you mm-hmm. know, because if you're not told the truth, you'll grow up with a very, uh, abs- uh, let's just say incorrect view of life. And when you've yeah. got an incorrect life view, then things like alcohol, addiction, drugs, abuse, domestic violence, all of these will then play a factor in your life while you try to work out why the life that you're trying to live isn't like the one that people prepared you for, right? And why didn't they prepare you? Well, because people run off their own egos. They, They will do for you what does them best, not what does you best. And so the reason I'm asking Danny about his background isn't to, you know, to, to, to sort of dig gossip or whatever. It's to, it's so that with all of my guests, I can show this kind of framework, particularly the military guests of why we joined up and what were, what, what were the reasons. And, and um, yeah, hopefully just paint a, a clearer picture of what, what life is really all about and, and how it Let's works. just pick up on that, Chris. You, you mentioned truth there, teaching the kids truth. And in the boxing gym, that's what we're doing, right? Well, I don't really teach too many kids these days because I'm out here in Thailand and we've got a sort of specific clientele. And I'm more, I work with pros a lot more now than I, I do amateurs. So when, when guys come, it's very specific what they're doing. And with the guys I've got here, it's a, a sort of maintenance thing with, with professionals who, who live here and, and teach scuba diving, right? So my world's different, but bringing up the kids and working with the kids in the gyms around the world, which I've worked, right, in Australia and Scotland, of course, as well. Teaching the kids the truth. I've always been there. I see the guy you're talking to. This is the guy that walks away from here and meets the next person. Mm. There's a lot of people who will speak like this now and then walk away and not even be the same personalities that we are talking right now and meet someone else and be like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. And that's, that's everywhere, right? In the family environment, away from sexual abuse, which is another t- subject that I've, I've really researched and been part of. And that is a major factor of how the system of our society is failing itself because it's rampant everywhere. Oh, People yeah. are now starting to talk about it, right? But let's stay on the line of talk, telling the truth. Parents don't tell the truth because they don't know the truth. It's a whole different story. You know, when they're telling you that ah, this is the way it's done, that's the way it's done, that's the way. It's like, why is it done that way? Because that's what my mum said. It was like, that's what Auntie Anne's done. That's what my... Uncle John does. That's my grandfather. Just fucking do it. That's it. Yeah. That's how I was brought up. So you're right. When you get to a point when you've had more experience, oh, look at us, man. We, we joined the Marines and then three years later, we've had more experience than both our parents put together. My dad's an alcoholic and by the time I leave the Corps, I've drunk more than he's ever drunk. I'm not an alcoholic because at some point during that alcoholism, he fucked up and he fucked up again. He fucked up again. So the only way out was to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm done. I'll get help. And, and it really didn't make his life any better and made their life a lot worse. Do you know what I mean? So the truth is, you don't know the truth. So when you don't know the truth, admit you don't know the truth. Ask, well, ask someone to fill it in. That's the other thing as well is, is, is you know, and th- these are all things for me to still be alive and not to be dead in some gutter, you know, somewhere. Uh, I've had to work all this out Danny so for people again for people listening this is not criticisms of people this is if you can't work out what human motivation is uh, or, or the motivation behind humans actions you know you, you're gonna suffer you know well I mean not everybody on a, pers- on a personal note though right so when I left the Marines as I said before it was like fuck 
you got married, yeah, I'm going to live my life, I'm going to do everything I dreamed of. I left from Colchester, right? So I'd gone AWOL for a while as a political statement at the end of my career. I'll talk about that in a second too. But mm. when I decided I was leaving the Corps, in my mind, I had to, I, I got um, a five month soldier on sentence in the court martial. And off I went to prison. And I wrote to the Major General who was involved in this incident that I was involved with that got me <laughs> to go away in the first place. And I said to him, man, <clears throat> I don't want to be that Marine who comes back out of prison here and then goes AWOL every two weeks until you throw me out. Please, let me leave with grace. This has happened. It's unpairable. I can't repair this now. I'm Sorry, done. Denny, I, I missed that. What, what was it that got you locked up? Well, I, I, get lo I got locked up, had a court martial because I went AWOL from the Marines. Okay. Um, which was a, a fallout of something that happened in, in Northern Ireland, like we were talking there before. The colonel who was in charge of that um, operation, again, I'm not going to slag off people here, but everyone who was on that tour, tour knows that was a very challenging um, chain of command um, that we were working under. And uh, the major general came to Fort White Rock to, uh, to sort of say hello and all that sort of stuff. And obviously I'd been in the boxing team. I was the Royal Marines boxing champion, the Royal Navy boxing champion. I'd done a lot of boxing in the circuit. So I knew the major general when I, hey, sir, how are you doing? over a beer after the fight, stuff like that. So I had, a, I had a little bit of a relationship with him. We'll call that false sense of security, right? So when he walks into the, to the, 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 the it was the, the TQ um, office, and it was, it was all Marines, couples, or couples, sergeant majors, sergeants, all standing around. They'd all been saying, they're going to say this and this and this, and they're going to get this fixed. You know how bootnecks are. Dripping away, telling you. And I'm only 19 or 20 at the time. And, and, the, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was a Lance Corporal. I was like, yeah, yeah, me too, mate. Yeah, me too. Anyway, the major, major general comes in, everyone's that up to attention. The first person he sees is me, and he goes, Ah, oh, Tenny, good to see you in uniform. Glad you're back in, you know, that sort of stuff. I'll come back to you in a minute. And he goes to the left of me, Hey, couple, whatever, how are you? And everyone, every single person all the way around, around the line didn't say anything they said they were going to say. And me being me, learning at that point in my life, this is me, um, I fucking told the truth. Mm. And uh, I told him it wasn't rosy. And yeah, we did find a lot of stuff, but this is what's going on too. And that, 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 that. The major general said to me, have you had your leave yet? And I was the last guy. I was the first guy taking the last leave at the time. And he went, okay, I'd like to hear your opinion when you come back from leave. I never heard from him again. But when that major general left by helicopter, the colonel who I was talking about was in by helicopter, demoted me. Gave me, a, gave me a, got me out of Fort White Rock and with, I think it was Charlie Company I was with at the time, sent me to HQ Company in the ration store, told the, the Sergeant Major to give me every shit job in, in Belfast that we had. And uh, I was very close. I mean, this, is, this, is, this was what my biggest dilemma. I could walk away from the Marines right now, fuck them, and go live with my auntie down in Falls Road. That's how easy it was for me. Do you know what I mean? So my mind was just playing over and over and over. Do I fuck these guys? And then someone said, that'll be desertion. Don't do that. So I then volunteered for all other jobs, you know, go out with the guys, be standing for this guy stand. So I've got lots of patrols in for HQ company, but pulled my head in. And then HQ's company sergeant major asked me what draft I would like. And they said, you can have anything. It, we admire what you did, but you're in shit, mate. And the biggest shit I've ever known anyone to be in. I went, yeah, okay. He goes, what do you want to do? I went, I joined the core to be SBS. That's all I've really had a focus on, you know, and, uh, and I said, but is, De is Diego Garcia unavailable on this draft list? And he goes, no way, fuck off. And I was like, okay. And draft me to the pool then so I can begin the process of selection. Be, be down there at least. And he goes, okay. So they, they flew me out of Ireland. Done my leaving, leaving routine at 40. Went to, went to pool before, just before the guys got they, back. They did all of this just because you told some boffin that... that yeah, I told them the things truth. Things were a bit of shit. Like, that he was charging people for this and doing this and these guys had been attacked and, and, and this, was the, this is their follow on, this is how they did it. That was the decision. You said, it, he said it was wrong, gave them all, ch charged them all, almost put them in prison. He was just, a, in my opinion, he was the worst leader I've ever met in my life. Not just in the core, but uh, the whole, whole spectrum. Anyway, so I, I remember the sergeant, <laughs> I get, so he, he comes to the Fort White Rock and the RSM calls me, I've got to go there. Immediately, and when I get in, the, the, uh, this is a true story. RSM comes running at me with his pay stick to, to stick me in the fucking chest. I'm a boxer, right? So it, it was just natural instinct to just turn and move his, move his, his, his pay stick. <laughs> he went flying, mate, you know, like you know, landed on his face, you know, on the, on the floor, which 
didn't go down well for me either. Mate. So by the time by the time I got to see the colonel, the colonel I can hear him in the office. The colonel was going crazy. He's going crazy, shouting about me, and I've got Chris Kane, the sergeant major in the back, going, "Daddy, listen, mate, keep fucking camp, don't say fucking nothing. <laughs> just just be there. Just just you're a marine. Look forward. Just take what's coming to you. It's all going to be all right." I said, "No worries, I will, I will." But as soon as they got me in, they, they, they opened the door and the RSM says, "Quick march, left, right, left, right, left, right." I didn't do that, mate. I just walked in slowly, and they made me go out again and do it again and do it again. And the third time, he realised, he pushed me too far, man. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm willing to go to jail now for this truth that I've just told because that fat cunt is, is um, excuse my French, that fat guy is uh, is misleading the the to, to us into danger, in my opinion. So uh, yeah, he's. And he was raging. It was like I was just disgusted the fact that he could wear a green beret and be that overweight and miss these BFTs all that sort of stuff. He said, "Do you think you could run this unit better than me?" And I just, yeah, yeah, I of course I could. Anyone could. Anyone could run it better than you. And that was it. That's when the stripe came off, and that's when I was told to go away. Wow. So when that happened, that happened. So I went to pull, and I got in pull. Just whacked me straight into you know, a couple of great captains down there and, and <clears throat> you know, it was really looked after when I got there. The core the core the guys in the core looked after me after that. It wasn't like I was I was the bad guy at the scene. Anyway, um they put me in the dive store. They started putting me on courses and all these different things, get me qualified so I could assist the guys and wherever they went. And then I got a message from my mate um from HQ telling me that the that the colonel who was in Northern Ireland's now a brigadier with an OBE, and he's, he's, he's got, found a draft for me in Camacho that I'd got to go and do. So when I had that, I went AWOL, and then come back for eight months. So basically, for speaking your mind, you know, ra- uh, and, and, and okay, you know, you, as a soldier, you kind of know you, 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 you can't, but you kind of, people like us do, <laughs> but rather than just get a slap on the wrist and like, you know, don't do that again, Marine Corporal. I don't know, man. I was, I was, I was a bit of a wild one, right? So I, I, it doesn't matter, you know. Like the, 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 for me now, looking back in hindsight, I gotta say that was the changing point. But you were basically to sub- subjected to a harassment campaign by this this guy that should have known better. I suppose so, yeah. You have a sauna? Um, no, I'm a member of my local. Are you familiar with the Life Centre? It's like a series of uh, British, like swimming pools and gymnasium complexes. Nice, and it's very, very, it, very reasonably priced. So, I'm a member of my local one, and sometimes I've actually been there three times in one day. So, nice. you know, to use the gym and the sauna in the morning, to take my boy for a swim in the afternoon. Yeah. And then to go and do Pilates in the, you know, free Pilates class in the evening. And all nice. of that works out to like £1.50. It's, it's incredible. So every morning, awesome. part of my morning routine is I, at the very least, go and have a steam or a sauna just to get my day started and have a bit, yeah, of, nice. have a bit of me time. And, um, but like I say, you drink a litre of water and then you've got to go to the toilet all morning. Yeah. <laughs> So where were we? You've 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 gone AWOL from the Marines. How did yeah. how did that turn out? Where, where did you go AWOL life. to? Well, yeah, that that that's that's when my, that part of my life changes everything, you know, because I left. But so I'd not taken my leave since Northern Ireland, right? So that's that's how this was able to come about. So I went to pool. I've not taken any leave. I've just went straight into doing all these, you know, amazing courses. You know, I look at my my driver's license and it's got everything on it. Everything, right? And that's because of my time going down there with, with, with the dive store. You know, I went to all these drive courses, free falling courses, dive courses, you know. I was, it, it was amazing to be part of. So, so to, to go AWOL from there was, was, was hard, a hard decision to make. But I believed that they were go- he was going to take me away from that. And that was that. I didn't have any hesitation. So I went to book my leave. I think I had three and a half weeks leave. So I took that. And uh, took all the money out of the bank and went to Tenerife, and uh, and danced and partied and kept on dancing and partying for three weeks. I hadn't thought about AWOL yet. Do you know what I mean I just knew I was going for a three week holiday? I didn't know what I was going to do. Actually, I was I was just I was I was done. And after three weeks, after three weeks, 
in, in Tenerife partying, having a great time, you know, like it just went on and it went on and it went on. And then the next thing, you know, I'm sending a, a postcard to the RSM and the, the Colonel of uh, SBS saying, sorry guys, I really am. But uh, I couldn't let that guy do that to me. No, Merry Christmas. Wow. So yeah. So yeah, I was gone for eight months, and that was again that was a that was a that was an opportunity where I could explore drugs away from the Marines and and, and explore all sorts of stuff, you know, and 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 then uh, really live life as a civilian ought ought not to be. <laughs> mm. How long did you stay on Tenerife? The whole time. No, whole I mean in, in in total in weeks or months. Um, I was gone for the Marines total eight months. Um, after about four or five months, I had to go home. We were all, I was, in the end, I was selling drugs out there. So one guy came up to me one night. I was just getting people into bars and stuff like that. And this guy came up to me one night and he said, here, take this cigarette packet. It had maybe 50 or 25 um, wraps of speed in there um, all folded into little rectangles. And he goes, I have to leave tonight. And that was the last I seen of him. He went, this is the guy who'll come and see you, blah, blah, blah. And because they were selling, back then you were selling so much drugs for guys, you're going, yeah, could you get that one for that person, that one, you know, so you were getting people into the bars, but you were also getting people hooked up with, with drugs, whatever they wanted, speed, ease, coke, marijuana, you know. And uh, so I went from getting that guy to help that guy to that guy who was standing on the, sitting on the cars, giving it out, you know. And, uh, and we kept on doing it. And we went from selling a little bag of speed to cocaine, to pills, marijuana, acid, and spent sometimes weeks in the mountains there and of Tenerife just fucking tripping, man. You know, like letting my mind go loose, you know, for the first time in my life, I felt really alive, do you know what I mean? Totally against being a boxer, you know, totally against being a Marine. Um, but I was intrigued by that new way of living. And because of the, the selling drugs, the partying, even to this day, I say I haven't yet found that confidence back from that period of my life. That's when I was probably the most confident in life. I didn't give a fuck about nothing. You know, mm -hmm. people crossed me; they got they got harsh, dealt with harshly. I crossed a few people, and I also got dealt with harshly. That's that was that was just a no brainer. That's how it went. I seem to thrive in situations like that. Do you mean same mm -hmm. in the Marines? If you're in, in your Northern Ireland or you're, I was five years in Iraq. I was on the ball every single day there, super confident, aware of what was going on. In, civil, in civilian life, if I, other than that time when I was selling drugs, I find it tough to go back to that same sort of confident, go lucky, get things done, get an attitude, because it's a little bit more complex than a civilian, isn't it? You've got to take into consideration lots of people's emotions and their reactions to things you say, how you say it. So, D Denny, just while it's on my mind, going back to Iraq, where, um, I think I'm safe to say his name, he's dead, but Brad, were you familiar with his demise? No. Uh, okay. Brad was a, a good friend of mine and, and many other people's um, who I worked with in the Marines down in Plymouth and a good few years after we'd all left, he, well, he wound up dead in Mosul. Um, didn't wind up dead in Mosul. He was uh, leading a convoy, him and another Marine, and they were ambushed by, I don't even know what you, who they were or what you'd call it, but let's say rebel fighters. And uh, in, in, in his attempt to protect his, his mark, do you call it, you know, his, his his, 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 his his principal his principal yeah his client um yeah. he was shot several times and uh it was kind of funny because i mean it it really was a case of live by the gun die by the gun you know um he'd done a lot of this private contracting around the world and security guard sort of work um uh, one time I was in contact with him, he was working on a diamond mine somewhere in Africa. And uh, he always used to say, you know, things used to get quite, quite serious. Yeah, I just wondered if you'd cross, cross paths with him. I had not, mate, nah. Yeah. I didn't even know about that. Yeah. Most of my time, that was, I was quite, for, I was really fortunate in my, in my roles in, in, in Iraq, you know, outside my Marine career. I remember I went to uh, 
the offices in London with the, con- the company who were um, contracting. And uh, one of four or five commando Zulu companies, um, former um, OCs, had, was, was interviewing me. And he was offering me a job, which was usually would have been for a, a captain or something like that, or a major. And I was saying, why are you doing this? You know, like, do you think I can do this? And because of, you know, what I'd experienced in life and since being in the Marines, I've done a lot of traveling, but I'd come back and I'd got, you know, diplomas in, in computer technology and, and running fiber optic cables and, and programming and things like that. And a, a large business with maybe 30, 40 sometimes um, employees. So my role had changed as a, as a, as a person, mm-hmm. as a leader. And who I was in the Marines, you know, at 24 when I left, was not the same person you, you're meeting at 36. So he said, I think you can do this, you know, and he, but he also said, if you fuck up, I'll make sure you never work in the industry again. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll take that on board. Mm. Um, so I went out there and I, and I, got, a, I got a role, which was, was, was where my role was to be a chief and also to be an Indian. Do you know what I mean? And, and I really bonded with the Iraqi people. Now, my time in Iraq wasn't scary convoys, hundreds of them. It was going to a location, setting up a perimeter security. and um, and then working hearts and minds to get the Iraqi people on board, especially in Al Hula. Um, we opened up a, a program, which was, uh, to, in the end, I had 56 of the local Iraqi people in all the main villages around their location um, doing night patrols and things like that. And I advised to be able to give one of, each of them every two weeks $100, you know? So it was, it was a, a great opportunity to get to know the people of Iraq without feeling in, in, they were my enemy. They weren't my enemy. Did you get in any hairy situations? Yeah, many situations. As I say, because I was living in, uh, in mostly secure locations, it was, it was mostly VBIDs, like a car bomb, or a rocket attacks when we were at the Iraqi government. I think two car bombs went off at my, one, one of my main gates. Because of, the head, because of the security government, complex one entrance goes into the green zone and one comes from the red zone so you have a military checkpoint alongside you have a, a checkpoint alongside the military so we were sharing checkpoints so thankfully i was working with the u.s the u.s army at the time um, but, and they were taking all of my considerations and they were getting walls put up in different ways and um, according to my team's recommendations and uh, so we were lucky. All, all those all, three car bombs, I think, went off in our vicinity with no casualties except the suicide bomber. And then again, I put it down to the, working hard at getting the funding to get these concrete bo- walls all over the Iraqi government. When I got there, there was no T walls, you know, like you seen TV, the barriers. I don't know if you've been out there, mate, but the barriers, the large, large walls, barrier walls, you know. And uh, I managed to get 600 of them given to me. Um, from um, Paul Bremer, actually, the, the sort of ambassador at the time. Um, because the, secure, the Iraqi government weren't given any funding. They were funded, they, I think it was $250 million they found in the complex where the government was built. So that was how they funded the government on Iraqi money. So the, Iraqi, the Iraqis weren't getting too much of American money. You could really work hard. Bremer was... Um, Paul Bremer, yeah. Yeah, he, but he was intr- instrumental in Project for New American Century, wasn't he? He was... You know, one of the cats that got the, how can we say, put this war together. Um, yeah, and left it, left it in its most important time of healing. He left after a year, right? And that was June, I believe, maybe the end of June he left. And the Iraqis and, and all, all of the coalition who are working with him, we don't need you to leave right now. You have everything in your head. You have every system in place. The next one, next guy's not got this. You need to stay. We've been out six months with it. Transition a little bit more. Mm. He went, mate. He went, I write about that in one of my books, actually. He left at that point. That was when you saw the demise of the, the Iraqi people and the Iraqi government because it was a begin again. When the DOD left after the first year, I think it was around October, but when they left, in came the, the State Department. And the DOD and straight State Department, it's almost like they're from different countries, mate. They don't talk. So the money that DOD had spent hadn't been accounted for. So the State Department were trying to make sure that they could account for where everything went, but they couldn't. And, uh, but it went to all their mates, didn't it? <laughs> it was yeah. Not, you know. And, and nine, nine, nine of the soldiers working at the Al Hilla complex ended up doing maximum nine years in prison. The rest were four and three years for embezzling money weapons, mm. working with a company called 
GBG, which was Phil Bloom was the guy who was doing all the corruption. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was very, it was very the wild, 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 wild west out there in the first yeah. couple of years for sure. So let's go back. How did you? We when did you get rearrested then by the or arrested after your AWOL period? Coming back in, we um, there was there was three of us actually. There was three of us who went AWOL um, over a period of time. I went first, then someone joined me, and then someone else joined me. Um, I can't remember when it was we handed a in, but we handed a in to CTC. We stopped on the door and said, "Hey, this is who we are," and uh, and that's how the process went. And then some guys from Pool get sent for me. Do you, but to that point. here's the thing, though, right? And knowing what I know now, I don't think the military would have given a shit if you'd never handed yourself in. No, I they don't. Think, they I honestly don't. I think your name would just become a blast from the past, and you could go on in civilian life. I mean. And there'll be people now say, no, oh, they get your number. It, yeah, but they wouldn't care to get your, you know, what number. And There was a couple of hairy moments when we, we flew. I came, I came back home. I'd fly into in Manchester one time. I flew into Birmingham one time during that period. And then the last occasion, me and my mate, we flew into Exeter. <laughs> but the time we got off the plane into the taxi, they were on to us, man. So the taxi driver then called the house that, we were dropped off at to tell them that the cops were on the way to the house. So literally we just legged out that house. And as we were going over the back garden, the cops were pulling up to, uh, to check that house that we'd just been dropped off to, to see where we were. So oh, I, there was some, someone on our tail. I, oh, the, wow. My God. Yeah. But we, but also we, we brought back some um, false 20 pound notes. So we were dr out drinking the night before with lots of false 20 pound notes. So I reckon we were, uh, they, they were onto us, mate. And as soon as I have to say, as soon as we handed ourselves into the Marines, the police went away and uh, I got sent to pool. And that was the end of that. So 18 months later, I had a court case. You were on a civ the civilian police were on to you. The, I mean, the, the regular police. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they'd found out that we'd, land, we'd landed the egg. There must have been a, I don't know, we must have been flagged for a flight risk because, or whatever because we've, we're known to be in Tenerife. But uh, so we used we used a small airport for that's probably maybe why we got away with it. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's so much I I I want to ask you. But let's go back to the the drugs thing on Tenerife. Then what what was your experience with 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 drugs, Danny? And and, out, and by drugs, I obviously include alcohol. What what was there one? You were partial to more. Was there one that did more for you? I, I, what I'm trying to get at is, I'm always fascinated to know why people develop um, problems and why people don't. And yeah, and, okay. Uh, my my my. First of all, I think we should start off by saying, in my personal opinion, all drugs should be legal, and all drugs should be sort of watch to make sure the quality is good and not damaging mm. to the to the user because we have to agree people like it people like it sure it goes to addiction but so does alcohol so let's stay away from the big scary but it makes addicts it's like yes it does make addicts but it also super boosts people's confidence and motivations as well so well, I, I, need, I need to step in there and say um if you're predisposed to addiction that's a mental health condition that generally comes from people who've experienced childhood trauma and even though the drugs might manifest that in you they i'm always saying to people drugs can't cause addiction that's right uh, it's like saying you know i bought a new car and it keeps making me have speeding tickets it's no, but, but look at Chris, Chris when, you were, when you were at your lowest point, you knew at one point that you were going to the lowest point. You didn't pull back. You went, fuck it. Right? Yeah. Oh, me too. I, I, so I, me too, right? I remember the moment I knew I was on a ride and I had to see it through to the end and, and our death was a distinct possibility. Yeah. But, too, I, right? but I, there was, I, I, this is what I'm saying. I was predisposed to a I I couldn't. You, someone who doesn't understand this would say, "Well, why didn't you just step off the ride? Why didn't you just go? Ah, that it, they, 
I can't because even... I think when you've committed to something, you and I are very similar, and so is everyone that's listening probably. When you commit to something you want to do, you'll see it through until you've understood what it is that you wanted to do. Go back to the drugs, right? So what, what drugs did we use? It started off with speed because we would get so fucking drunk. Someone would say, have a, have a little dip in there. And then all of a sudden you weren't drunk anymore and you could party a little bit longer. That was my first introduction to, to, to drugs and tariffs. Mm. So that would be like your back pocket just in case you get too drunk sort of thing. Then it became, of course, you're doing it a little bit more. Before you go out, you're doing a little bit, you know, and, and then before you know it, you're buzzed all day long, right? Um, marijuana was part of that. So when we went back home, it would be smoking weed to bring yourself down. Um, and that's how it went on for weeks and weeks. By the time I was given the party drug of speed, I no longer wanted to take it because it was, it was making money. I didn't want to use it. So I went on to pills, ease. Um, <laughs> it sounded with some nice ease, you know. So <clears throat> if I was to say, what's my, my, tr- my drug of choice would be to take a very good pill, an ecstasy tablet, and hang out with my best friends until it wore off. That would be a beautiful way of spending the day drinking champagne, having a few few joints, having a laugh, a few shots to bring it back up, bring it back down. Yeah, that would be definitely how I spent most of my time um, taking drugs. Um, but when I started selling them, they were coming in in, in bags of 10,000. So just taking a handful of them for you and your mates didn't even, didn't even matter. So we were taking them sometimes three, four nights, five months in, you know what I mean? So by the time I'd been there, maybe five months, I can't remember the, the specific days, but I decided I'm fucked. I looked in the mirror and went, skinny, lost all your muscles, you look kind of tripping look in my face, going, wow, you look evil. Um, I'd already contracted a couple of sexually transmitted diseases that I didn't know what the fuck they were, so it was, I was in a bad way, do you know what I mean? So I bailed, I went home, took my girlfriend at the time with me home, stayed in Scotland, went to the boxing gym for two months, maybe just, maybe even a bit more than that. Got fit, got healthy, got off all that, didn't even smoke weed, didn't drink anymore. And then went back to Tenerife to see my two mates who were still AWOL, but they were both fucked, like, like real bad junkies, man. And two mates, civilian mates, who were also running the business with me. And we'd went from having, I don't know, 10,000 pounds in the, in the kitty to buy anything we wanted to having 10,000 old and drugs. That's what happened when I left. Mm. They just went down, downhill. So I had to spend the next six weeks getting them out of that debt. And then that's when we pulled the plug and that's when we went home. I can't believe, see, I can't fathom how you had the foresight to take yourself out of there because, and, and, uh, and get yourself in the boxing gym and start eating and, and basically stay away from the drugs. I've had, I've had boxing in my life since I was 11 years old. And every time I've realized that whatever stage it is, I'm broken. I put my tail between my legs, drip my ears, and walk into the boxing gym where the people have always been doing the same thing for years and years and years. And you walk in and they treat you like you're, I've been doing it since I was 11 years old. You're going into a gymnasium, you're 26 years old or something like that, 20, 24 or 23, I suppose, as Marine. You want to be 22. And they're looking at the state of you, but they've seen it happen over and over and over in their life. But they didn't expect to see this Marine hero, boxing champion, always the coach, you know, all these things that, who I'm meant to be and who I'm always supposed to live up to. When you see a, a drug fuck skinny guy walking in with sorrowful eyes, the ears pinned down and tail between his leg, but he's normally the fittest and most confident person in the gym. So, so it sounds like you had a massive binge in Tenerife as opposed to being, in my case, a slave to addiction. No, because I was AWOL from the Marines. I had, them. I had never intended to be AWOL for a dessert. I never, I was proving a point to this colonel in my, I don't know, young adolescence going, fuck you, you want to fuck with me, I can fuck your core back. You know, that was my mentality at the time. It wasn't anything else. It was just, I knew I had to get away, fuck them. And, 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 and I found myself doing this and, and with this environment, joining Marines at 16, being 22 and partying, having hot chicks everywhere, all over the place, you know. It was, it was very attractive, you know, it was an attractive way to spend that period of my life, which was set in stone, I was going to go back. Do you mean? You I couldn't go back a junkie. Yeah, you must have met a lot of Marines when you're over. You know, Marines on holiday and stuff. They come and see me. They knew where we were. <laughs> they knew where I was. So the lads would get to leave, and and twenty of them would come and hang out with us. Wow. And 
have you like subsequently in in your life i mean obviously this was 20 years ago have you had periods of drugs in your life again or have you done party drugs yeah you know like because of that experience i don't have a fear or an anxiety over people taking um um drugs for recreational use you know like i think it's very normal living out here in thailand man you know like it's illegal to do drugs out here but there's still drugs around you know so yeah it'd be very, very naive of me to sort of not acknowledge that right um smoking weed's been part of my life i suppose you know since i left military operations in 2008 so you know I, yeah it's part of my life you know i always say that you know i'm sort of an advocate maybe for um, bringing marijuana legalized marijuana back into the to the world i think it's a great um way to to release stress um of course there's paranoia and, and a few other things but look, i went to america and got my my medical license for marijuana um, because I'm a veteran. They gave it to me. Yeah, no worries. That was it, you know? And even the American doctor went, I've never really met a real Scottish person in, in, in uh, Scottish guy in person before. I was like, wow. Does that license work in Thailand then? Is it accepted or? Yeah, it does. Um, it's, it works, in, um, it works in, in Canada for sure, 100%. I scored some weed in, in Canada from one of the dispensaries with that license. Um, here, I do believe that the, the, Thai, the Thai government are accepting that license also, but it, it expires every two years, so you've got to get another one. But I suppose my whole point there is, I'm a boxing coach, I'm, a very, I'm an artist, I'm, I'm a musician, you know, I'm a writer. Um, I don't like having angry thoughts, I don't, I don't like being an angry person, I like to be patient and listen to people so I can try and understand them better. Um, I know smoking too much weed can make you fucked, and, and, you know, you, you can't think and you're too high, but that's because you don't understand it. You're not blending it well, or you're, you're mm-hmm. overdosing it, you know? So the way I like to use weed is just a little bit um, throughout the day even, you know, just a little bit to just keep, them, keep me artistic and, and mellow and creative. But uh, you, can't, you, can't, you can't take too much of that and then go and talk to people or, or drive around, you know? So yeah, um, that's that. Cocaine, cocaine was probably my, my hardest drug that, to get off and, and, and caused me the most destruction. Amazing. For sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's no, there's, there's cocaine. I've no, I've no, I don't know anyone who's continually used cocaine who hasn't ended up with a severe story of sadness to tell at the end. Oh, well, my, um, my wonderful friend, James English put, put a post out the other day on social media and he was, he was kind of inquiring or, or suggesting how many, how many of you know there's a massive increase in suicide in in western society right and he was saying how much of that is linked to cocaine use which is rife um, i would say most guys who are taking their life is to do with some sort of substance abuse mm. i would say i would i don't know how, how that goes statistically but you know when you're sad when you're saddest even when you're most skint you go and get alcohol so yeah. most people do what this i'm on the last 20 bucks fuck it get a bottle of wine yeah, you know, well, it's I'm, self-destruct. I'm I'm at a place now where I'm having to deal with all those feelings and emotions and um and triggers without anything, you know. Um, I mean that's that's what I'm trying to do. I, so I'm, you're totally teetotal now. Don't have a drink abs- or like that. Yeah, yeah, I. <sighs> It's such a, I mean, we could talk for hours on this alone, you know, and I, I make no judgment on anybody. I always in my heart had a tiny little place, even when I was massively on drugs. For a period, I, I, I genuinely thought I wanted to live the rest of my life on crystal meth. That is how brilliant it made me feel. Yeah. And I was young, so my mindset was like, well, if I die 10 years younger, so freaking what? At least I led a creative life and I was like smashing it and, you know, bang. And, and it's, as we all know, you do anything drug for long enough, it, you don't smash nothing, right? Yes. But going on from there, I had friends that were like, oh, I'm a weed smoker. I'm always smoke weed. I'm always going to smoke. And that, that, that particular guy's dead now. Yeah. And when he said that, I knew he was going to, I knew drugs were going to kill him. 
and I said to him, look, you don't have to make this line. I'm a this or I'm a that. Be fluid. Be like Bruce Lee, you know. And you, know, you just said that. Honestly, I have a guy right now um, who over the last few months has had some psychotic episodes brought on by cocaine, caused himself a lot of damage recently. <clears throat> He's coming to train with me. Um, and, and he said the same thing. I've always done this. I've always done that. I'm always going to do that. And it's interesting for you to say that that guy's dead now because I'm literally dealing with this guy in the next sort of weeks or so. He's coming in to train yeah, with me. Yeah, but I mean, you know I mean, for anyone listening, just the benefit of, I, I've got the chance to say this and put it on YouTube, is if you fuck with drugs long enough, you stand a good chance of dying. You, you, you 100% know, agree with you. you. You fuck with acid. It can go very horribly wrong, as you know. I and, and also out. let's 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 do this. Let, let's say on acid, I've got many friends who've, who've who over the years and last few years, not I've not done any drugs for a long time, except I've a little bit of weed here and there. But I don't do any drugs like that any, anymore. One of my friends in Australia has been admitted to hospital twice because of acid trips. It put mental mental institutions. It's something to be careful with. Oh sure. God, God. So the point about my my friend was. I wish he could have been more like me and gone, well, do you know what? I'm smoking weed this day, but next week's a new week in my life. I don't know where I'll be or in 10 years time, but not necessarily because of this rigid mindset he had, but he went on to alcohol after giving up speed, uh, uh, like a 20 year speed habit. Yeah. And by this time I'm guessing his internal organs are taking quite a bashing. Yeah. And what one night he drank himself to death. Literally, he went out to celebrate. It was actually his mum's birthday. And in the morning was in such shit state, all his organs had started to fail. Got him into hospital. And uh, he died about a week week later. Um I'm sorry to hear that, mate. Well, oh, well, I've just, I mean, let's not say any names, but you're probably yeah. aware another best mate of mine. Yeah, just, yeah just, me too. Yeah. Just, just drunk himself to death. Yeah. And this is really... And there was no talent. He's our friend. There was no talking to him either, man. There was, there was no oh, getting, getting through. It's not just there's right no everything. talking to them. It's that people around are in such fucking denial of what yeah. an evil drug alcohol is and yeah. what alcoholism is. Yeah, Everyone, when I was, I was just telling them that this chap's going to die. Oh, no, he'll be all right. What it is, is you, your body, I'm like, no, you don't understand. His, his organs are failing. He's dying. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a substance misuse specialist. So is my partner. We've seen it. She sees it all the time. He's got about a month left. Oh, but he's, yeah, he stopped drinking. Oh, fuck, has he stopped? That's what he says. He his eyes go yellow. No. That's what it tells you because you're easily, you know, yeah. uh, pacified or whatever the word is, but, but by, mm -hmm. by, by that, it's not, you can't drink for 40 years of your life and then just stop. It does just doesn't work like that. That's you know, right. you, you possibly can if you go to something like an AA meeting where it's quite rigid and, 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 but, but the, the natural cycle is, is lapse and relapse. And when your organs are failing, you can't afford to relapse. It's just that yeah. simple. But you haven't yeah. got the wherewithal up here to be strict with yourself and not drink, you know. And so um, the point where I'm at is I am now at that point where I'm living the life that I always secretly what thought I, I at least wanted to try it, Danny, you know. I wanted yeah. a period yeah. of my life where I don't take drugs, um, including alcohol and you know I'm out training and I'm, I'm trying to be a good father and you know and and uh, yeah and so I have a lot of emotions and feelings and triggers and and, and I have my anxieties and my stress like everybody else it's only now I'm having to find the completely spiritual way of dealing with it, you know, to stop. How do you find that? How do you, how, what's your um, technique to keep it spiritual in, in that sense? Well, the first thing I say is nothing happens in a day, Danny, you know, yeah. 
it's That's not true. it's not like you can read a book and bang i can deal with it all now it's very i've got certain patterns in my brain that have been created over drinking and taking drugs for 27 years every single day yeah. that i'm now having to try and reverse through just through learning and, and practice right so we're talking things like med you know subtle med no, okay so what what but specifically what is it you're trying to reverse because uh, is that a feeling when you were drunk you had about certain things that now you're not drinking so much you're changing your perspective is that what you mean um sorry i'm just pausing there because it's telling me my internet cables on but it's gone away again that's fine no i can give you a specific example when you drink for 27 years every day what happens is you suppress your body's natural chemicals. And so your body's ab ability to say manage stress, you get stressed, right? Yeah. Your brain does something. Let's not try and be scientists, but your brain does something to control that stress. Otherwise you, you, you're going to burn out, right? And die. When you use alcohol or, or drugs like heroin, what your body does is say, oh, wow, I'm getting all this drug given to me here for free. I don't need to produce it up here in anymore. So it stops producing yeah. it. Gotcha. And gotcha. then when you get stressed, you go beer. Oh, right. I'm chilled now. Or, or spliff or heroin, what, what, whatever, yeah. It, yeah. whatever it is, right? Now, what happens when you stop, particularly when you've done it for as long as I have, is you get what's called rebound effect which is when my stress comes up rather than stop here because my brain is, is, is dealing with it. And this goes for every emotion, by the way, you know, what happens is I haven't got that chemical and I haven't got the beer. So the stress, it just goes through the roof and it it's, and it's not just people that have drunk or taken drugs that can experience. I, I, I'm gathering, you know, extreme anxiety can, can happen to not, not anyone, but happens to a lot of people. Um, so this isn't just about drugs and alcohol, but I'm talking about me now, right? It's just my, my situation. Yeah, your experience, yeah. And that is that when I get triggered by something, and it's, with me, it's always a, a, a human thing, right? You know, what I mean is I can walk down the street and see a car run over five people and I'll just go into action and do, you know, what needs to be done. It doesn't, I don't have any, that doesn't trigger off any emotion in me like it probably, you know, likely yeah. would in most I, most, yeah. most, I think I, I, I right? suffer a similar system of thoughts. But, but to the other side of the coin, if I fall out with someone, someone I care about, you know, or it doesn't even have to be, that really affects me quite, um, that affects me as a person anyway. It's just part of my personality type, I guess. Would you say you're sensitive in nature? I think I'm sensitive to picking up on the things that like take place in, in scenarios, right? Whether I over you know overwork them or over is i don't know i just think human relationships are, are very sensitive by nature right it's so easy to yeah. upset someone without meaning it or or even maybe you do mean it and then you've got that dilemma of right how do i repair this um yeah and and some things are quite easy um, I mean, it, it, it's so hard to give you an example, Danny, you know, like, like, a, 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 I mean, for example, someone called me stolen valor or whatever this American thing is the other day. And I, I, I like, I couldn't get it across to anyone enough how much I just couldn't give a shit. <laughs> like, honestly, it, it my identity doesn't lie in being a Marine 25 years ago. If it did, I think that's a bit weird. 
like I didn't yeah. do 22 years or something that but did 22 years in in the Marines it would be understandable that would be a big part of my identity I did seven years you know yeah um, and so if someone wants to say you haven't served absolutely fine you know it's something I did when I was a, a kid right yeah. It, it, it's like saying if someone wants to say I wasn't in the Boy Scouts, it, I, again, I, it, it, it doesn't affect me in any way, right? But on the yeah. other hand, um, yeah, I, I can't really give you an example, but what I will say is as I've got older, I don't necessarily think this shit gets easier. No, I don't either. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it would be lovely to think. I hear a lot of my friends have got PTSD, they've suffered PTSD and all these different things. I've never been diagnosed with anything like that because I've always moved around the world. You know, in my deepest, I broke my face on a motorbike accident two years ago, almost died. I broke my shoulder, a car hit me on a motorbike a couple of years before that. I blew my hand up, missed my finger here, and, and for eight months couldn't even move my hand. These things happened outside the military, outside the war, the war, right? They caused me more, to, they gave me more time in healing that I realized, fuck, I think I do suffer a little bit from post-traumatic stress disorder. That's why I've been so wild drinking. That's why I've been so wild with my points of view and all these different things. So when I broke my face two years ago, I decided I'm going to take a back, st take a back step in life. I'm going to start watching my son's accent, see how he would deal with that. Not talk, not jumping on the, yeah, well, this is what I think, you know? And in the last two years, just by sitting back and watching the world unfold, where I would normally jump in and make some statement or be part of some, you know, part of the conversation that I'm now looking, because I'm a little bit older, plus I've had this trauma outside and um, what I do here today. I'm teaching people how to be strong in the body and mind every day, that's what boxing is. So when I took a back seat, I started to realize that it's not that important what I think to people. It's just the voice. I don't influence them. So stop. Don't go with four paragraphs. Be happy with two sentences and get your opinion across and then sit back and let the conversation yeah. go without you. Do you know what I mean? Rather than, nah, 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 that's bullshit. I read this and I know that and I've got this experience and, and try to convince them that they're on the wrong path. That stressed me out. You know, that stresses me out a little bit because... You know, if a guy has come across here, you know, and spend two or three weeks training with me, guys who are being amputees, you know, and, 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 and had a lot of injuries and a lot of mental health injuries and guys who have come across here who have been on door's death, two weeks with me, you know, like two or three weeks training here changes the whole, whole perspective on life, you know? Mm. There's no lies here. There's no nonsense here. The beach is beautiful. You can go, as you know, you can go scuba diving any day, any time of day you want. You can, you know, you can go at nighttime, you can go in the daytime, you can go early in the morning, you can go in the afternoon, you can go for a night dive, you can go climbing, you can go, you can kayak, you can paddleboard, do whatever you want, right? So because we've got this freedom here, I mean, I've had it for eight years, so I had a bar for the first four years, so maybe I abused that freedom and got drunk too much and had a great time. Hmm. But the last four years has been about having a boxing gym, you know, working with people on mental health issues, working with people on physical health issues, you know, and and and, and then... I have to sit back now after 11 years, I've been out, even since Iraq, the last time I was in Iraq, 11 years outside the military and 11 years doing this. I've changed how, a lot of people's how, lives. How do you, I mean, you're in Thailand, right? So it's kind of like this party environment, this tropical paradise, you know. How, how do you keep a lid on the drinking then? It must be tempting to feel like every night is a holiday. Well, of course. And I think when, when we first got here, I was writing books you know so I've written a lot of books that are unpublished um maybe for the first four years I was writing sometimes 16 hour days you know so we we had a bar the bar run itself we were part of it so it would be you know I, sometimes I'd wake up at four o'clock in the morning I would write all day until four o'clock in the afternoon you know and then I'd go down to the bar have a beer and then that would be that you know you'd be you'd be there until the end so it was for me back in the day with the bar I my wife and I we both had horrible divorces so there was child cust custody cases and all that sort of stuff. Very, very stressful. So are you, for me, are you you're married now, Danny? Yeah, I've been married now for eight years. Are you married now? Lisa, 11 years. And where's, is Lisa a Westerner or is she? Yeah, Lisa's from, uh, she was born in Canada, moved to 
Australia, I think, when she was 25 with her ex-husband. She had three kids there. And uh, obviously, I moved my kids out to, to, to Australia with my ex-wife in um, 2005 or four, something like that. And uh, everyone's still there. So I met Lisa. Um, we were both on a training course. She's also a trainer and <clears throat> had gyms in Australia. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so, yeah, I met her. 13, 14 years ago, something on a, on a training course. And then didn't speak to her again for about two and a half years. And I launched my first book, Fighting the Demons. And, and she sent me an email. And I think I was, I was on my way to New Zealand. I was at the airport going to New Zealand for a couple of weeks. And then when I come back from New Zealand, I don't think we've uh, maybe been apart one day. And I owe, I owe all of my, this guy to Lisa. Lisa's not been in the party scene, she didn't do those drugs, she didn't have those nightclubs, she didn't have those thoughts and sexual, you know, sex addictions, maybe another one that I'm guilty of having as well at one point, you know, she doesn't have that sort of part of her life. So when I met someone who'd only had a, less than a handful of partners in her life and had brought kids up since her early 20s, it changed me, you know, it changed me because I'm now, I'm now, I've now fallen in love with a real soft person who's got the patience and got the time to listen of course, she's sexy and she's lovely. We, we share the passion for training our guys. So we have lots in common every single day. You know, we're talking about our clients, we're our friends. And uh, so my life, my love life right now is perfect. And I would say I'm an expert in how do you find love? I'm an expert in how do you maintain love? I'm an expert perhaps in how to generate more love when it comes to that. Whereas 12 years ago, coming out of my last marriage, I was not an expert in any of that. But the patience that I've been able to have in the last 11 years with Lisa has just changed the, the, the dynamics of who I am as a professional, as a, as a trainer, as a boxing coach, as a, as a dad, as a, as a person, you know, um, I've managed to give time to love. Whereas up until that point, I always felt I was unlovable. Truthfully. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, uh... I don't even know what to say in that department. I, I just, I just urge anyone not if you're in an abusive relationship and it's, it's going nowhere. The person's not willing to accept change. You need to get out of it. You must, you know, and I, I'm, I'm an advocate. Family is the most important thing. However, if you've been abused in that family environment, man or woman, you know, like Lisa was abused in her family. I was abused in my marriage family in life you know terribly when you think about it but we both share that have that in common it's not a man thing it's not a, it's not something it's both of us had sort of similar um experiences and manipulation and lies and cheats and unfaithfulness and these different things that you know broke my spirit man like for a long time you know, when i came back from iraq i, I wrote fighting demons frantically getting the, the the truth of being strong and being courageous and getting this just back from iraq down on paper you know and and when you, I refer back to when you say fight, fighting demons is the name of your book, Danny. What, what, what demons are they? Fighting your demons is the name of the book. Um, I, I wrote it for boxers, um, for young boxers trying to um, get uh, on with boxing, overcoming fear of getting in the ring, understanding where how to be inside the gym, where you put your mind when you're trying to work on moves in boxing and breathing in boxing and all that sort of stuff. So. What Facing Your Demons was about was about your inner self, your inner demons, and, and exposing them to yourself, acknowledging that, that they're there, and get to work on them and improving yourself physically and mentally by being aware. It's very, very much in the same process of meditation. I mentioned meditation a lot in there, you know, um, and the same as any boxer. I got to keep the boxers calm in that chaos. That's the key to my, my success as a coach. That's the key to them and their success in the ring. If they start getting frantic and doubt themselves because they've taken too much double jab cross left hook, fucking might have, uh, might have spun them into a negative thinking. We've got to make sure we have tools in, in place over the period of time that we can, we can make sure that they don't have those negative thoughts. For the, for the Marines listening, or servicemen as in gen, gen service men and women in general but i'm thinking men now because servicemen have got this mindset if you get an issue go and do fizz you know and that is brilliant for breaking the cycle of bad mental yeah, it really is. absolutely yeah. it really but is. the one thing I'd, I'd want to suggest people there is while you're doing your fizz which is great you've got to work on your mind 
because Correct. what can happen to people who use exercise as a, their form of meditation is when the day comes when they can't exercise through injury or, or through ill health or old age, suddenly their main become sad crux that they've used isn't there anymore and all That's of right. this comes back. So I think it's really important to I try and liken it to if you were in a six by six box and there was nothing in there, just you sat like this, could you be happy? And you know maybe how long for you if you was in that box for so let's say twenty three hours a day by your bath your bathroom and your 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 lunch, your supper or whatever you know could you get yourself in that zone where nothing mattered everything's in perspective you know whatever your philosophy is you're you're an atom or a molecule in the universe or or a collection of them could you you know I'm yes okay I, I don't want this challenge i don't want this challenge i don't want to do that but i think because of my my understanding of meditation you know and my understanding of um of being alone you know i I've been alone a lot, you know, and when I left the core, I went to Australia and I lived with the Aboriginals. That's not another good story. That was the beginning of my spiritual life, you know, when I, when I met the Aboriginals and they taught me a good few of their secrets and their stories and the meditation. They let, I learned how to play didgeridoo in a, in a way that becomes meditation. They taught me how to communicate with the universe and communicate with the animals and, and, and find water and all these different things. Fascinating stuff. So... When I left the core, my first two and a half, or my first two years was a uh, surfing movie in the first six months. But then after that, it was about Aboriginals finding out their dream time and what that meant. And that changed me forever, Chris. That was, that was, the, that was the beginning of this guy. You know, like, yeah, I, I may have stood up for what I thought was the right thing in the Marines and then rebelled and went AWOL and to fuck the world, did all the drugs and then worm my way back into good fitness, handing myself back into Marines, did another 18 month down in pool with these guys and then, you know, left, went to, went to, went to Australia and, and then began that journey. So when I come back from that journey, you know, my mom and dad know me as a strong, you know, bootneck and they saw a long hair, long beard, black as a black guy, you know, like, and skinny because I'd been eating coconuts for like three weeks at a time to try and see what, where your brain could go with that one, you know? So mm. I'd learned a lot, you know, and, and since then I've done a lot of Buddhism here in Thailand. The first two years, my wife and I went sort of heavily into um, long meditations. Is, is, honeymoon it work, is it working, Danny? I mean, you asked, uh, yeah, you, know, yeah. you asked me what I'm doing and I, I, I'm on a journey and like I say, I did shit for 27 years, so I don't expect it all to work in a week, right? This, yeah. this, this being drug-free thing, I mean. And yeah. by drugs, I um, get bored saying it, by drugs, I obviously mean alcohol being the worst, worst drug out there. And the easiest um, accessible one too, of course. Say right. again? It's the easiest accessible yeah, one too. So yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that one guy listening, a male or female, sits here and listens to this, and and and, and maybe one or two of them would say, "Well, I've not drunk in a lot of years. I'm not really a drinker." Most people would be saying, "Well, I have a half glass of wine, half bottle of wine at night, or I have two beers at night, have my TV. That's no problem." And and I have to say to you also, is, is living in a, an island like this, if I didn't drink, all I would do would be here, to the gym, to here to the gym, to here, to the gym, I would go crazy because I'm a personality kind of guy. So I need to go down to the beach bar and see my friends. Do you know what I mean? And I've not really in a few years went down there and not drunk a beer or two beers. You know what I mean? During the day until you know, Saturday evening, we, we don't drink from the morning till eight o'clock at night. Twice in the week we have the afternoons off of the sunset because again, if we just keep on working, we never see the sunset, man. We're at work all the time. So twice a week we make sure we get a chance to go to the sunset. And for me, that's the cold beer time, which leads to three, four, and five. That we're back home or in bed, 10, 10 30, something like that. We're back up at seven. We're, we're charging on with the day. But, and this is a big but, and on the 26th of this month, I begin this again. When you go on a detox, yeah, and the detox that we use generally are a super nutrient um, alkaline juicing, you know, so all vegetables, no, no fruits, no all that, just pure alkaline, bring your, your body into an alkaline state. And at that point, then I'll engage in meditation again. But I, I engage in meditation most of the day, to be honest with you, especially in boxing and training and all that sort of stuff. But when we do this cleanse, 
it's, it's Lent on the 26th of, of February. This is the first Lent that my wife and I, we're both Catholics, Buddhists, and I suppose studied Islam too, so I'm not one or the other. So I've not had a, a chance to do a full six-week Lent with something positive. You're um, the first so th person I've met outside of, of professionals. No, I'm not saying you're not a professional, but I mean, you know, like... I don't know what, I'm a specialist. I, you're the first. I'm just a good old boxing coach. Yeah, well, I mean, you're the, you're just the first person I know that that understands the alkaline diet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've done. I'm, and in the next few days, you you'll see what, throughout the post I'm going to do. I've studied just recently just a, a research of the keto diet. A research, and it's interesting, man. A research of the paleo diet. I learned something brand new about these diets. My personal. Um, summary of both of them is this keto diet it means you take away all the, the, the carbohydrates and the sugars so your body doesn't produce that energy you put your body into a ketosis state it takes about four to five days for your body then to fully get into the ketosis state so that's like four or five days of being depressed having diarrhea having flu-like symptoms and all these different things which is quite horrific Anyway, it goes in your, your, your fatty tissue then, or the fatty cells get broke down, and the energy source is found, so you're burning fat to produce for your body's energy. That sounds horrible to me, but for the epileptic and for the Alzheimer's and people like that, that's the only diet. It was created for them. The ancient Egypt, in, in the ancient Egypt, that began the research of intermittent fasting and keto diet, right? So... That diet goes all the way back to then, man. That's an ancient Greece beginning. It starts again, 1911 and 1921. Doesn't come really around again until the 90s, and then here we are with keto diet, right? But it wasn't for the general public. And that's something to note because there's a lot of shit missing, right? You need more nutrients than that is. That was to help someone who was ill to be healthy. Mm -hmm. That's why it's created. The fact that it burns fat is a byproduct. It's not necessarily the way to live your life yeah, in a healthy exactly, way. Yeah. Paleo diet, I don't know if you know about this either, but I was fascinated. Paleo stands for Paleolithic, the old yeah. stone age. Yeah, yeah. The whole diet is based on the old stone age. So basically you go back all the way now to 2.6 million years ago and come to 10,000 years before Christ. Yeah. Oh my God, you're eating like them? That's amazing. However, 10,000 or 15,000 years before, no, since then, We've been eating wheat and drinking milk and all these different things. And there's other nutrients that we've, we've managed to put into the system. Mm. The body for 15,000 years has been dealing with it. It's not new to it. <laughs> so you've got to say, okay, the old, old, old Stone Age Paleo and the new Stone Age Neo, they're both important. So it would be interesting um, to, to, to incorporate both diets. And that's what you talk about now. You know, the low alkaline diet is, a, is what I would call a metabolic diet you know, to, to super boost your metabolism. It's what we need in boxing, we, you know, to get the boys down or the girls down to their ideal weights for their, for their fights. You can't starve them like we used to do. You know, you've got to have them full of energy and you've got to have the body, again, out of the acid and into the alkaline so that the fuel being used um, is being used daily. Yeah. Not storing anything. I just um, liken, for people listening, I just liken alkaline living. I don't like to call, I don't like the diet word, but... I just like an alkaline living to, to, you know, your blood has a certain pH that it's supposed to be. If it, if it wasn't, it wouldn't have it, right? It's fine to go acidic now and again, and it's fine to go alkaline because our ancestors would have had different periods. You know, there would have been one day that they probably just ate fruit, in which case yeah. the acid in their blood would have increased. But then the next day they might have just been able to eat stinging nettles. And then the, you know, it, it would have counterbalanced, but so long as you can keep that m meridian or that, that you're right, absolutely, it's about balance. You know, your your body's not basically burning itself out, and and I look at that middle way as what humans would have eaten for the longest time of our evolution. So the two odd million years that you talk about, Danny, yeah, yeah, you know, compared to the modern diet. You know, which is past, start, which is which is processed since the Second World War, or First World War, really. Yeah. You know, it's you guys need food. That's how you get food. The move yeah. never really went back to the natural way again. 
but I mean, it's getting better. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say that because I live here in Koh Sao, you know, and there's, there's no farms on this island and there's no dairy farms. There's no um, produce farms. So we can, everything comes in every single day fresh, right? Mm. So we're kind of lucky, man. We're sort of getting that forced upon us to have organic fresh food every day, you know? So I'm kind of lucky in that sense. I don't have to go to a supermarket or an organic farm to get all the right stuff because it's available to us just by, uh, by living here. That's you know what I mean? Right. That's great. Yeah. What about lots of um, vitamin D with the sun? I, it, two things I want to ask you, ask you: Is there a lot in? I mean, in Thailand, the drug used to be yaba, right? Yaba, yeah. This, this little red pill of methamphetamine that's made in Burma. Yeah. Is it still called Burma? Ma- Burma, Ma- yeah. Or Myanmar, Myanmar, Burma. But yeah, they they refer it to Burma. The, the Burmese do. Yeah. They call it's was Myanmar an ancient name for Burma? It's gone back to Myanmar. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, it's both, you know, you, depending on who you're speaking to, but the Burmese people refer to themselves as uh, Burmese. Because I've got it on my map here, my, my world map. It's got both names. So. Yeah, so, so I think it's, it's what it is. It's, um, I'm, I'm sort of asking this more on a personal nature than, a, than an informational one, because I've got friends living in Thailand, and I, I just knew that they had big cocaine problems. I just wondered, is that a drug that's easy to get in Thailand? Yeah. I mean, again, it's one of the drugs that I've never used um, since, the, since way back in the day, you know, so it's not something that I, that I, would, be, uh, that I would be inclined to, to look or go towards, but I know for a fact that there, there's people out there who do cocaine. And because my boxing coach and they've offered me over the years gone by, you know, like, do you want a little, do you want a little, what do they call it? Bump? Do you want a bump? And many years have passed me going, I don't do that. And making, making them realize that I had done that and, and mm. to such an extent that doing that isn't what I want to do. So yeah, no one really comes near me. It's a great bit of boxing coach. You know, you, people don't come to you with seediness. They yeah, come to you going, good. Hi, man. How, how's the gym? You know, and so it, I don't really get involved though. But in Thailand, yeah, it's, it's available. It's definitely available. Yeah. I think most things are. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing I was going to say is, um, because I'll just tell a little anecdote, but back in the day in Thailand, the, the thing, the thing for travelers was you could go in any chemist, a bit like in India, and just say, oh, I think I'm a bit fat. And the, the chemist... In tablets. Yeah, the chemist would just take that as their cue to, to give you over the counter these diet pills, which were basically speed. And the effigy, geez, yeah. They were quite strong, mate, you know? They we used to use them back in the day, man. In London, we used to use them, man, to uh, when we were on doors. You know, we would, we'd walk in. Because remember, when you're on when you're on a door back in London, we'd been been bodyguards during the day, or we'd been tasked through the day, and you're going from one job to another job to to doing your uh, VIP security on the doors, Christmas, let's say, and you're all tucked up. And then one guy, the body will come in, who's, who's got loads of effort in tablets because he's uses them to cut and make himself look lean. And give you a little, a little eff- effigent tablet, man, you know, and the next thing you know, 20 minutes later, you're biting on your gums, you know, it's like, oh, it's pretty strong. Yeah. So, yeah, you could get that stuff out here. Um, um, it's definitely not as easy to get um, over-the-counter um, prescription drugs here. But, mate, you can still get a sleeping tablet pretty much anywhere. And you can get any fa- farmers and ask for a, a Xanax or a, or a Valium. We, we should get. point out here, Denny, shouldn't we, that Thailand has got some of the toughest drug laws in the world. And if you're Ooh. a... Yeah. You're a Westerner and you do drugs in Thailand, you're just asking for trouble and it's not worth yeah, it. Absolutely. And I would highly recommend not to do it unless you know, you're know you in the safest place and that's the thing you really have to do in your life. I would recommend don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it when you're traveling in Asia. Don't do it when you're traveling away from home. You know, for the, for the hit that you're going to have for that little couple of hours isn't worth the consequences that can go on. In these in these countries, man, and, and yeah, so I would say, I think weed is is pretty kind of decriminalised now, man. But if you get caught smoking weed on the on the beach, you're going to jail and you're going to get maybe a six hundred, seven hundred dollar fine or something. Like that. So yeah, uh, be sensible, man. That's it. You know, yeah. Thailand, Koh Tao is not the place to come and go party mad. That's no. Pattaya or Bangkok or maybe Phuket or something like that. But Koh Tao, like you know, it's a it's a, it's a small, cool little island that that I think is the the has the highest turnover of scuba diving um, qualifications every year is is based on a need i need to ask you then danny because and don't get yourself in trouble here um um but 
I've seen documentaries and they've been about mysterious deaths of Westerners on Kotal. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the the alleged allegement, if that's a if that's a word, is that there's some sort of Kotal mafia that run the island and a cover for some reason a cover up these deaths or or they cause. I, I maybe you could. I'd love to. I would love to. Right. So. On that particular evening, I think it was um, Hannah and David were murdered on the island. Um, both Lisa and I here, we, it was a Sunday night, we know, because we had a, our bar had a live music gig that night. We did is, every that, Sunday. is that the one where they put the suspects with the motorbike helmets on? Yes, yes, I'm sure. I'm they, sure they, it was they, a, they, a very, they, very horrific murder on the beach. First yeah, that's ever happened. They got two guys that were... To, to, to the outside observer, look clearly freaking innocent. They were from Cambodia or, or some, they were immigrants. Oh, from Burma. Burmese. Burmese, Burmese. Burmese. And they basically put these statements in their mouth that you killed these people. Okay, yes, we did. They prayed. Okay, so, you, so you've, got a, you've, got a, you've got a couple of things going on here. There was media reports coming out from a, from a newspaper from another island, almost like a... Um, an island who competes for, for tourism. Um, and that, that um, escalated that story. That story, it's almost like the, the, the expats here sort of seem to think that there's always a conspiracy, it's something happening. So that was, that was frantic, All right? So on the morning of that, that happened early hours, I think three o'clock in the morning. What actually three, happened? Three, I don't know. So, so the evidence that was there in the morning was two dead bodies. One woman had been raped. Um, we found out later she had two um, sets of DNA semen inside her. Um, she'd been hit brutally, killed in the head. It was, it was terrible. We would not go there. It's something I don't want to think about. Um, and the guy was found in the water. He'd obviously been clubbed over the head with something as well. So up until that point in that morning, no one knew what happened. Um, the police caught off the area. I mean, don't forget, there was like six police in the island, mate. It wasn't like that. There's hundreds of police in this island, man. It was like, this doesn't happen. This is something that was never seen or heard before. You know, that was crazy, right? So I know the guys that were involved with it. I, I helped set up a, a police volunteer um, group here um, a few years ago, a few years ago, something like that, to help the police have expats with them a little bit with experience in the military or experience being here a long time so they could help consult I think mean, really really helped you know like bringing just don't forget when that happened this island went down spiraling down you know like we all live on tourism tourism no longer came you know death island i think it was being called as well right so in that particular incident having spoken to the police who were involved with that they all have the same story the same story right it's all the very same story it went to the courts the court took it to the supreme court both courts said guilty the evidence that was the strongest was DNA evidence. That's what they're saying. That's, that's the facts. That's been two court cases now and one in the Supreme Court. I, I, fe I followed it as much as I could. Um, there's an element of the expat community, an element of the Burma community, perhaps an element of even the Thai community. Stick with the original narrative. That wasn't the, 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 so the original parties, narrative. The, so the DNA was officially found to be from these two young men? Correct. Okay. That's what they've been accused of. That's, that, that's the reason, that evidence is the reason that they have continued on being guilty for this crime. And also there was a phone, something like a phone, uh, one of the guy's phones, one of, that, the, one of Hannah, Hannah and David's phone had also been stolen. That was found very close to one of the locations. Okay. So I there's lots of different evidence. If you, look, if you look, it's just recently happened, you know, I think at the end of last year, the guys got the su Supreme Court um, um, verdict and they became guilty again man so yeah you can jump in and say all right that sounds good that sounds good that sounds good but being a guy who's been involved with the military been involved with the, the, the services and, and I can watch and I can read evidence and I know how things aren't going and you know when the British people are saying that that evidence was good enough to de determine that that was those two boys mm -hmm. you know you've got you've got a lot of evidence coming in here which is which is real and a lot of he say which is out there which is continually um, driving people away from the island, you know, which is, which is sad because it's such a beautiful island. It's not Death Island. And then there was a, a series of suicides too, you know, 
I, when I first got here, right, this is the truth, Chris. When I first got here, I spoke to one of the cops. I mean, I'm, I'm just going back on Iraq. I used to train the Iraqi police, right? So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of the cops. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are, right? So I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how they are and what, what, what they have to deal with on a daily basis that perhaps people don't ask questions like that. And I, I said to one of these guys, I said, what's, your, what's the main crime? What's, what's the thing you deal with most? And he said, suicide, Danny. For some reason, people come to this island, lock themselves in a, in a, in a, in a um, paradise room looking over the ocean and fucking talk themselves or go into the bathroom and talk themselves. And he said, that's, I think that's mostly what, what I would say the, the hardest part of being in this island. That was before the murders. That was years and years ago. Man. So that's real, you know, and that's, that's unfortunate when you live out here in a beautiful place. There's, there's a lot of people who want to come and end their life here. Um, I was aware of that before these murders. Mm. Um, and then there's been a, couple, you know, a few deaths here and there. That, hey, it's, it's not a big place. I think it's 26 kilometers around it, right? It's not a very big place. It doesn't have a high crime rate. It doesn't, um, it, it's, it's nice. Do you know what I mean? These mafia families and all that. Mafia families, sure, maybe it was 30 years ago or 20 years ago when everything was a little bit wilder in the world, you know? We were, maybe we were all mafia or something or other. But it's just families with power who have, who have benefited from t- tourism. and. Uh, I don't see any, I don't, in the years I've been here, I've never seen anything yeah, okay. that, would, that would be untoward I, towards me. For, for anyone listening to this, I'm, I'm only vaguely aware of this situation from stuff I've seen. I've got no, like, star, I'm not saying this is the official narrative, so, so don't. No, and I, and I, anyone's I, I spoke to, to hundreds of people who come here and, and they say, I wasn't going to come because you know, I read the press about this, that, and other. And, and, and you help them say, okay, well, let, let's go and let's go on holiday. Let's see what happens. And, and they all say, you know, things like the, the last few guys that came and saw me over Christmas, they were like, we booked in four days with you, Denny, but we also booked in four days over in Samui. And then they come here, they're four days here, and then they go to Samui. And then they realize, ah, Kota is much better. There's so much, there's so much calmer. It's not busy. There's no cars flying around. It's still it's got that little, um, it's, it's cool. It's a nice little place, mate. Yeah. So yeah, got a lot of bad press. Um, harsh thing happened. Um, horrendous for the community. Horrendous for the families back home. Um, absolutely horrendous for the for the people who stayed out here and, and sort of and had to deal with the, the the drop in tourism, which is obviously put a lot of do, a lot of businesses into. Do they still fold. have the full moon party on Koh Phangan? Koh Phangan, mate. Yeah, every month, and then they have a black moon black moon party too. It's still, it's still busy, man. Have you been to many of those? I've never been to one, mate. For the, all the reasons I was talking about earlier. Oh, okay. I, I went to one back in the day. Bought yeah. some, I bought some of those diet pills from the... Yeah. The woman just looked at me and went... Like, like yeah. she literally went like that and then went and got them. There was no more. Um, popped a couple of them and then jumped on a roaring speedboat from Koh Samui. And we just powered across the ocean... And it was, on a, it? it was on a particular stormy sea. The weather was, oh, yeah. was quite, quite fine, but the sea was really, and this speedboat was just launching off the waves, right? And those guys, a bit, a bit like the drivers in sort of Arabia, they've got two speeds. It's either flat out or, or stop. So they're flying these speedboats across these wave tops. And it was really funny because one guy had obviously come from business, a business meeting in in bangkok and he still had his suit and his briefcase and everything so you know, he's obviously heard of this party and he he'd come down on the overnight train or or flown into the airport or something and um he was kind of you know giving it all the verbal before the boat the boat left shore and this sort of thing and very chatty with mate half a mile into that journey he's just said like that with his brief- <laughs> yellow green in the face about yeah. to throw up but uh, i just remember in the morning on that and this this can be a warning for everyone in the morning the police were stood all along the cliff tops undercover police just watching the beach and they were waiting for any westerner well anyone but particularly westerners because we've got generally tend to have more money to light up a spliff that's what they were waiting for or to pop a yeah, man. whatever and then they were going to come down and obviously extort money, money out of them. But uh, yeah, full moon. 
I think that's that's you know the, the the system of policing out here is a little bit a lot different from back home. You know, they get um, I'm not sure how how it officially works out. You know, but you got to think to yourself. This is my world. You got to think to yourself. Kid gets caught with a joint. Some cop might say it's going to give me ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand baht, and I'll let it go away. That goes into the police station for for the the team in there, and you walk away without going to jail. Yeah, it's a system. It's a system that shouldn't be mocked. You know, it's a system that should be understood, and you should know when you come here if you're in big trouble because you were aloof, nonchalant to the fact that you are in another country with laws that have severe penalties for these. For, for doing these things, then you have to be aware that this is how this country works. You know, it has an option to bail out before it gets too seriously. Not for a serious crime, but it has an option to bail out too seriously, but it might cost you something like that. It might cost you a little bit more money. Um, you choose. You want a criminal record in Thailand and go to jail for six months to six years because you like to smoke weed and have it on your pocket because you were showing off to everyone. Do it. Why don't you go fucking have your joint somewhere privately, come out stoned and enjoy the day. Go back home, wherever you are, have another one. It's not, you wouldn't do it in Britain. You wouldn't walk around smoking joints at um, some, some you know, festival for, 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 for whatever. Not a festival, you know. You wouldn't, you'd be cautious and you'd be careful. Don't come out here and think that because everyone smiles, it's going to be okay. So Danny, listen, I, I'm, I've got to go and fly Spitfires. Oh, lovely. Which is just something I do, you know, as as a as a pilot. Brilliant. And I've got to um, go and sit in Spitfires actually, but also fly a Spitfire simulator. Wow. Um, which um. Well, have a enjoy that. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I, I will. It's how uh, long have you been a pilot now? You've been a pilot for well, for a while? I, I use the term loosely. I'm a qual- I'm a qualified pilot, and I have a license for life because I took my license in America. Okay. Yeah. Um. I don't fly planes simply because it's just astronomically expensive in this country. Yeah. And the truth is, and, and unless you're really passionate about that, I, I haven't got that money. Yeah. I, I, well, I haven't got that money, Danny. That's the, the yeah. Of it. yeah. Flying is fantastic though. It can be quite scary when you're up there on your own and it, you know, you start hitting turbulence and stuff and, but uh, yeah, but today is a, it's kind of a bucket list day because awesome. I never, you know, never thought I'd get to sit in a Spitfire. That's let, impressive, you know, mate. Let alone go in a Spitfire simulator. And um, maybe when the, the, the mega bucks roll in, then I'll fly the, go and pay to fly the real thing or at least sit, sit in the real thing up in the sky, I mean. But um, brother, I can't wait to pick this up again. Because I think awesome. Yeah, me too. Again, I think next time we should do a sort of podcast special on fighting, and you yeah, that'd be us, great. You know, fighting and 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 fitting that in with um, you know med- meditation practices and and spirituality, this kind of thing. Absolutely, uh, understanding nutrition. I think we talked a little bit of a nutrition there, but I think the most important thing to maintain good mental health, especially for veterans and people who suffer de- depression, is to understand the concept of food as fuel. It's a fuel for your body, not just something you sit down to three times a day just because that's what you learned. Or you, mum did that, dad did that, auntie did that, grand did that, so that's just what you eat. Yeah. We have to break that cycle to understand what's in that sausage, what's in that egg, what's in that potato, how much of that you have, how much of this to have. Not necessarily change your whole world, but understand, give yourself the knowledge that food is fuel. The food will fuel your brain power. Your, you know, your body will fuel your body to do whatever you do. You know, you like your exercise and the way you do it. Of course, I get mine out in boxing and, and strength and distance training and, and obviously helping these guys get stronger. But the most important thing is to understand nutrition, I think. And don't be over complex about it. We have proteins, we have fats, we have carbohydrates, we have enzymes. Don't worry about anything else. Let's tell the truth about that, Chris. That would be good. And we'll also talk a bit about your write. We'll talk a bit about your writing as well. That would be great. Awesome. And then maybe swap, swap some stories. Um, yeah. Do you want to message me all your links? Any links that you want the public to have? So for your gym or, or whatever you want to share, or where people, will do, yeah. where people can find you on social media. And uh, mate, lots of love to you. 
Thank you. Thank you you too, time, mate. Danny. Pleasure, um, brother. Keep up the good fight. Ha ha. Always. <laughs> Later, brother. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Cheers, cheers. Friend, thank you for watching my video. I'm the only person I know that has ticked every item off my bucket list, and I did so coming back from chronic addiction with no help from anybody. Now I want to pass those skills on to you, but I can't help you unless you help me and hit the subscribe button. So please do so, and let's go and smash this world together.